Hi everyone, welcome to our class on graphs. So today we'll start talking about graphs. We talked about linked lists, we talked about trees, uh, binary search trees, AVL trees. We talked about hashing. And now the next topic is graphs and weighted graphs. So we'll basically finish before the midterm two data structures. And then the last topic of the class, which are programming languages, paradigms, and uh, uh, basically functional programming will start after the midterm next week. So today, in today's class, we'll learn how to model real problems using graphs. Uh, we'll start with a little bit of history. Uh, Euler introduced the seven bridges of Connie's work problem. And I will basically explain how is it related to graphs that basically we model it as a graph. And then how do we solve such problems with graphs? We'll basically have simple algorithms today on uh, depth first search, uh, breadth first search, and basically how to solve problems using these uh, different types of search. Now, we'll start with simple basic uh, uh, topics and terminologies about graphs. We'll learn about vertices, edges. Simple graphs are those in which there are no parallel edges between the same two nodes and no uh, uh, self loops. Uh, we'll talk about weighted and unweighted graphs. Most of the graphs that we'll talk about today are unweighted graphs. And then the next class, or probably the following up, uh, class is going to be on weighted graphs. Uh, we'll also talk about uh, directed and undirected graphs. Again, today we'll talk about undirected graphs. And in one of the future lectures, we'll talk more in detail about directed graphs. Uh, we'll learn how to represent vertices and edges using lists, simple lists, or edge arrays, edge objects. We'll talk about basically defining a class where you have the source and then the destination, adjacency matrices and adjacency lists. We will model a graph using the same terminology and style that we have done for uh, the previous uh, uh, data structures like binary search trees. We will have an interface graph with all of the methods that are relevant for uh, graphs but unimplemented. Then we'll have an abstract graph in, uh, class which basically it's a, a abstract class that allows us to model the methods that we can implement. And some of them are abstract methods. And then we'll implement a subclass of that abstract uh, graph class, uh, concrete unweighted graph. And we'll learn how to dis uh, display graphs visually. So we'll basically have a simple problem in program in with JavaFX to model a graph, let you specify what are, what are the positions of these nodes, and then we'll represent the edges between these nodes. We will uh, represent the traversal of a graph using a tree inner class to an abstract class, uh, graph. And basically this is a spanning tree for the traversal of the graph. We will design and implement depth for search and then we'll solve the connected circle uh, problem using depth for search. And then we'll design and implement breadth for search. Basically, we, we talked about these two terms when we talked about trees. If you remember, uh, basically depth for search is implemented with backtracking. We go on a path until we reach a node. And if we want to backtrack, we'll backtrack with two its parents and so on. So we basically can implement uh, methods like in order or even uh, post order traversal of a tree using uh, depth first search. But we also talked about breadth first search when we talked about uh, trees. Uh, you can keep a queue of the unseen uh, nodes. And then when you take a node out of the queue, in the case of a, a tree, we would add the children of that tree to the queue. And that basically implements a breadth for search because we basically traverse uh, level by level the tree. Similarly for graphs, you start from a node, you represent the, the neighbors of that node, you put them in a queue, 
then you take one neighbor at a time and you add its children or its neighbors that haven't been seen to, to the same queue. And in this way, we basically do a breadth for search traverse. Then we'll solve a, st a standard problem called the nine tail problem using breadth for search. This will be probably the next class. So we'll do most of the terminology and basics of representation of graphs today. And then we'll leave the algorithms and part of the implementation next class. So lots of problems are solved with graphs. Graphs are extremely useful for modeling real problems because many of the problems that we have like travel uh, are represented as a graph problem. You have all of the hubs of, uh, of uh, basically all of the airports uh, as the vertices of a graph. And then if there is a flight between any two cities, it will be basically represented by an edge. Now, one problem that all of us have, if we travel, we want to find the shortest path between any two vertices, any two uh, cities. And you can see that there are basically cities that uh, have a single uh, flight from, like Denver. And if we want to get from New York, LaGuardia to Denver, we would have to fly first to uh, Phoenix. And then from Phoenix, we can fly to Denver. So this is a standard problem. In this case, the graph has uh, weighted edges. Basically, each of these edges is a distance. And then the shortest spot between the two vertices in the graph would basically be the probably the cheapest flight. So this is an example of using graphs. But this is not always uh, quite true because sometimes a longer distance is cheaper just because uh, the flights on that uh, uh, path are not uh, used by other customers. But we'll basically model a lot of problems as graphs. So many different problems uh, are basically modeled as graphs, like networks of communication. Even now, what we are currently, what I'm teaching over Zoom is using internally a graph for routing uh, from me to you, the video that I'm basically uh, streaming. Uh, the flow of communication, computation, social media, uh, uh, basically, if I want to find how am I connected to another person, uh, I basically represent would represent this as a graph. Travel, as the example that we saw before, computer chip design and the communication between different integrated circuits on the board, mapping the progression of neural uh, neuro de degenerative diseases. So it's used actually in uh, uh, heretic uh, diseases and in biology. So basically, we want to represent a lot of problems as graphs and then develop algorithms uh, that basically solve different graph problems. And basically, all of most of these uh, graph transformations are represented by graph rewrite, uh, rewriting systems and uh, graph search uh, systems. And in, in many cases, actually, this is a discipline by its own. Uh, understanding real world systems as a network is called network science and is studied in applied math and, and uh, other fields, operational systems, optimization, and so on. Now, the entire uh, representation of graphs or gra uh, problems as graphs started by, uh, was started by Leonard Euler. In, in 1736, when he introduced a, a graph problem uh, to solve a graph terminology to solve the famous seven bridges of Konigsberg problem. So basically the city of Konigsberg where Le uh, Leonard Euler lived uh, was in Prussia at the time, which today is actually in Russia, Kaliningrad. And it was divided by the river Pragel and there were two islands on this river. Uh, the city and the islands was connected by seven bridges. So there was the A side of the city, or basically uh, the north side of the city, the B side of the city, the south side of the city, and there were two islands, which I labeled them with C and B here. 
And you can easily represent these as basically a graph problem. A was basically the entire landmass that was on the north of the city. B was the entire landmass that was on the south of the city. Then we basically had two bridges that connected A with C and two bridges that connected C with B. These are parallel uh, edges because they basically connect the, the same two nodes. Then we had uh, another uh, situation where the island number two was connected by one bridge to A, one bridge to C, and one bridge to B. Now, the problem that Euler actually tried to solve was, can one take a walk, cross every single bridge exactly once, and return to the starting point? And basically, if represented as a graph problem, uh, this was this actually is sta stated in a bit of a different way. Is there a path starting from a vertex, traversing all edges exactly once, so all of the bridges exactly once, and returning to the start vertex? And Euler actually proved that such a, for such a path to exist, every vertex must have an even number of edges. So we can actually see that that's not the case. A has three edges. Uh, C, in fact, has five edges, B has three edges, and D has three edges. So it's not true that, in fact, every vertex must have an even number of edges. So the, therefore, these seven bridges of Konigsberg uh, problem has no solution. Now, we'll first represent the, the graphs as a problem in mathematics, and then we'll actually represent it in computer science as a program. So a graph G is a tuple, V and E, where V represents the set of vertices. So in our case, it will be the set of A, B, C, and D. And E represents the set of edges. Basically, all the edges, you can label the edges if you want, or you can represent the edges as a pair of uh, the two vertices that are connected, some pairs. So you can, you can see that E is not really a set if you have parallel uh, uh, edges because the same edge would be twice in that bag that is the set of edges, that is the, the collection of edges. Now, uh, graphs can be undirected. That means that in the set E, for any single tuple uh, of uh, uh, a pair of vertices, if the pair V1 to V2 exists, then V2 to V1 also exists. So that's an undirected graph. Basically, the direction of that doesn't matter because both directions are present. And then there are the directed graph problem when basically, let's say that this represents the like relationship and Peter likes Mark, and Jane likes Mark, and Mark likes Wendy, and Cindy likes Wendy. So you can basically see that uh, it's not always the case that if somebody likes somebody else, that somebody else likes back, back the original problem. So directed is basically a different problem, or a different kind of problems that are represented by uh, graphs. Now, Let's continue with the terminology. Adjacent vertices is defined as follows. Two vertices in the graph are adjacent or neighbors if they are connected by an edge. Today we'll talk about undirected graphs. So really, today we'll not discuss about directed graphs. You can consider that basically all edges are uh, in both directions. You, don't, you can go from one vertex to the other and back. So these are really undirected graphs. There is no arrow who's going to, how is the flow of information going, okay? So two vertices in such a graph are adjacent if they are connected by an edge. And that edge is said to be incident to both vertices. Now, if this would be directed, you would have incoming versus outgoing edges. But Again, today we'll talk about the general problem of representing an undirected graph. Like for instance, the, the bridges problem, it didn't matter if you're going uh, in one direction or the other. In those times, there were no one-way bridges. These are all 
in either direction, you can consider that there are two lanes, one going in one direction and the other one going in the other direction. The degree of a vertex is the number of edges incident to it. So the degree of, let's say, the vertex number two in this case, uh, the, this lower left uh, vertex is two because there are two edges incident to it. Similar to this node, this node, the one in the right lower corner, lower uh, right corner is uh, the degree is three because there are three out, uh, uh, incident edges to it, okay? So really the degree is the number of vertices that is incident to uh, that, ver uh, the, uh, edges that is incident to that vertex. Then there are complete graphs where every single node uh, has a, a direct edge or has an edge to every single other node. So every two pair of vertices are connected and it, they don't have to be arranged in some kind of a regular structure. They can be random nodes, but from every node you can get to every single other uh, node or ev every other uh, vertex. An incomplete graph is one that you may have edges that are missing. So this is an example of an incomplete graph. So really we have complete or full graphs and we have incomplete graphs. And again, the interesting problem are those that are incomplete because you would have to find parts longer than one. Then there are weights associated to edges. So an unweighted graph is like the one that we have on the left hand side where Every edge has uh, a unit uh, um, cost or distance. And really we are not uh, labeling with a weight any one of the edges. And there are weighted uh, graphs where the edges actually have a weight. There are like, for instance, a planar graph is one that is uh, uh, put on a geographical plane. And then the actual, the weight between two nodes is the distance between those two nodes. So for instance, 75 is shorter than 95. This is a longer distance, but is greater than 35. This is a shorter distance. And this is even a sh shorter distance, the five one. And then we have 45. So basically a weighted graph is one where you pay a price to go on an edge from one vertex to another. And some problems like the ones that we'll discuss next class, Dijkstra shortest part algorithm is uh, basically consider weighted uh, edges. Parallel edges. If two vertices are connected by more than one uh, uh, edges, those are called parallel edges. So for instance, this uh, upper right co uh, left corner uh, vertex is connected to the lower uh, left corner vertex and with two different edges. So those are called parallel edges. We usually try to avoid such representations of graphs where we have parallel edges. A loop is an edge that links a vertex to itself. So here we have a loop. The green one is a loop. The blue ones are parallel edges. A simple graph is one that doesn't have any parallel edges or loops. So this is not a simple graph, but other graphs that you have seen up to now were simple graphs. They don't have loops, they don't have parallel edges. Most of the problems that we try to solve are for simple graphs. There are no loops or no parallel edges. Most of the problems in industry or real life match to simple graph problems. And they are a little bit simpler to solve than the ones that have parallel edges and loops. Those are also interesting. If you consider the Konigsberg problem, they basically, uh, it has parallel edges. So there are algorithms to solve those too. And they kind of contain sets. So uh, edges will be represented as a bag. A connected graph is one in which there exists a path between any two vertices. So for instance, this is a connected graph because basically there is a, I can choose any two uh, random vertices and I can find at least one path between them, okay? 
one in which you basically have uh, two parts of that are unconnected, at least two parts that are unconnected are basically non-connected graphs. A connected graph is a tree if it doesn't have cycles. So for instance, the previous one uh, is not a tree because as you can see, you have a cycle. But this one is a tree. In fact, you can choose any one of these vertices, you consider it as the root, and then the rest is really a tree because you have a child, you have other child, and you have other children and so on. So you can represent it as a tree. And in fact, given a graph that, uh, that is not a tree, like this connected graph, uh, one problem is to extract a subgraph out of it. A subgraph is basically also a graph where the uh, set of vertices of the subgraph is a subset of the set of vertices of the original graph. And the uh, edge set is also a subset of that uh, edge set of the original graph. So really, if you consider the original graph being the union of all of the uh, vertices and edges that we have in this figure, the blue one is basically a subgraph. So you can basically see that some of the nodes are, in, are contained and all of the edges that connect those nodes that are in the subgraph, it's a subgraph. A closed path is, or a cycle, uh, first of all, a closed path is a path where all the vertices have two incident, uh, 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 where basically all vertices have two edges incident to them. So basically the blue one here is a closed graph. You start from one node. You can usually we label the nodes. So this would be A, then B, then C, then D. This is a closed path. A cycle is a closed path that starts from a vertex and ends to the same vertex. So for instance, this is also a cycle because we can basically start from the upper uh, left corner and go back to the upper left corner. Uh, it doesn't have to contain all of the nodes in the graph. Uh, if you want to contain all of the nodes of the, uh, in the graph, that's basically an Hamiltonian cycle. An Hamiltonian cycle is a cycle that visits all of the nodes in the graph in a cycle. And there is also a requirement that it doesn't visit the same node more than once. So exactly once, but we'll, we'll talk about Hamiltonian cycles later. A cycle right now is just a closed path uh, from one vertex that ends uh, in, its, in uh, the same vertex. A spanning tree. So given a graph, a connected graph, a spanning tree of the connected graph is a subgraph of the graph G, which is a tree that contains all of the vertices of uh, the graph G. So for instance, one of the spanning trees of this graph, of this connected graph that we have below, is the blue one, the, the one that is using blue edges. So you can basically, uh, basically start from any one of the nodes. And this is an example of a spanning tree. I basically visit all of the, uh, all of the vertices from one root. And I can declare as the root being this node. But really, any one of the nodes can be considered the root because it's a tree. So you can consider all of the nodes connected to it as the children except the parent. So I, can, I could have chosen this as the parent, and then this is his child, and these two are its children, and this one is the child of this one. OK, so as I said, we'll start with the simplest problem. How do we represent vertices? Then how do we represent edges using an edge array? How do we represent uh, edges using an edge object and an edge class? How do we represent edges with adjacency matrices? And then how do we represent edges with adjacency lists? These are different ways to represent uh, edges and is by no, way, uh, no means complete. There are other ways, many other ways to represent edges, sometimes with a bitmap uh, and so on. So the first way to represent vertices is with a list of all the vertices. So for instance, this is an array. 
And in, in every element of the array is a string that basically contains the, the label of that vertex. So vertices is an array of strings. It contains Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Denver, Kansas City, and Chicago, and so on. Boston, New York, Atlanta, Miami, Dallas, and Houston. And now the vertices can conveniently labeled using natural numbers from zero to n minus one, okay? Because we had n vertices and we keep them in an array labeled with zero for the first element. The same way you can represent instead of using an array of strings, you can represent it with an array list of strings. And this, the advantage of this is that you can add elements to the uh, array list without having to create a new array of uh, more elements. Or another way to do that is to have a class that represents the node, like the vertex, like for instance, the class city, and then vertices would be an array of objects of instances of that uh, city uh, class. So the, an array would be the first kind of representation of vertices. How do you represent edges? So first solution is to represent edges using a two-dimensional array of all of the edges. So for instance, here I have a two-dimensional array that states that this is the set of all the edges. And each edge is basically the source followed by the destination of that edge. So we have an edge from zero to one in the array of basically vertices that we had before. So we basically use indices in this array as basically values of uh, the edges in the edges double, uh, dimension, the double dimensional matrix. So there is an edge from zero to one, one from zero to three, one from zero to five. The only reason why I represented it like this is that all of the edges that start from one node are represented in one row. So 0, 1, 0, 3, 0, 5. 1, 0, 1, 1 2, 1, 5. 1, 3, sorry. Uh, 2, 1, 2, 3, 2, 4, 2, 10, and so on. So basically you represent it as an array of edges, which translates into a two-dimensional array of integers. By the way, anytime you want, you can stop me if you have any questions. Edge objects. So you can represent, you can create a class edge, which has uh, two integers as the vertices u and v. And you can basically have constructors, accessors, and mutators for these two uh, 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 vertices u and v. So in this case, you can see that the uh, list of edges is basically a list of the edge class uh, objects. So it's a new array list. And in this new array list, we basically add every new edge created with a constructor in that edge class. So new edge between zero and one, new edge between zero and three and so on. Like we had in the previous example, only that now the edge stands as a separate object. We don't need the two dimensional matrix to represent them. Storing the edge objects in an array list is useful if you don't know the edges in advance, because basically uh, you can create them with a constructor whenever you need them, and you can add them to the array list. You need, again, you don't need to resize the a matrix or an array of objects. The arrays are fixed in Java, so basically you need to represent them in some other way, like a list or an array list. Another way to represent edges, which is popular, it's extremely popular, maybe the most uh, popular way is an adjacency matrix. So assume that you have n vertices, then you can represent in a two dimensional n by n matrix, uh, the existence of edges between any node and any other node. So this is like a bit map. It states if there is basically an edge between uh, uh, a vertex with index zero and vertex with index one. So if one is here, then it means there is an edge between those two nodes. If zero is here, then it basically means that there is no uh, edge between the row number 
and the column number. Okay, so this mat matrix representation represents that that first example that we saw. We we had all of the cities, major cities in USA, and then we basically wanted to represent uh, flights between those two cities. And in our case, flights are undirected. Basically, it means that. Uh, the, the plane goes from one city to another and comes back to the original city. Now, this matrix is symmetric. So we have an undirected graph. That means that if there is a flight between zero and one, there is also a flight between one and zero. No? So we can basically, first thing is that we can uh, discard half of this matrix. We can basically use the ragged array to represent uh, the matrix and actually below the uh, major diagonal because basically that is states only that there is no loop. There is no plane that flies, that flies from New York and comes back immediately uh, to New York. So since the matrix is symmetric and also we can discard the major diagonal, we can save storage uh, if we use a ragged array. It also requires a little bit more manipulation of indices in order to find exactly, because you want first index to always be greater than the second index, because basically that basically says that we are looking at the lower part of this matrix. Another way, which again, it's extremely popular, probably the most popular way to represent edges is an adjacency vertex list meaning that uh, the vertex, vertices or neighbors is an array of lists of the integer indices of the adjacent uh, vertices. So for instance, Seattle, which was neighbor of uh, neighbor uh, array for the vertices uh, of zero states that the neighbors or the destinations directly accessible from Seattle are those with indices one, three, and five in the neighbors, uh, in, in the basically the vertices table, uh, vertices list. So basically, we represent neighbors as an array of lists, which are the destinations for direct flights from Seattle or from San Francisco, and so on. So the list of integers that is represented by that index variable that is the element are those where there is an edge between the index of the index variable and the nodes in that list. So basically this states that there are flights from zero to one, to three and to five. This one states, the second row states that there are flights from one to zero, from one to two, and from one to three. And similarly for two, these are the nodes that are basically connected to two. Okay, so there is a question in the chat. Would the first means of declaring the adjacency list, uh, uh, vertex list, require you to resize each array in the list object when adding new vertices? Um, that's for all of these, you, so, okay, that's a very good question. So the question that Adit is pointing, is pointing to is what happens when you want to add new vertices? Uh, some of these are easier to manipulate because you basically adding a vertex in, uh, uh, in basically this representation, the adjacency vertex list would require to add an additional, basically, again, you actually need to uh, create a new neighbors array because it's an array. You basically cannot add elements in it. Copy all of this and then add an additional uh, uh, list for the neighbors of, the neck of that 12 node. But in the same time, you also may have to add 12 to any one of these other lists if there is an edge from 12 to that node. So it's not easy uh, to modify the representation of edges if you are adding vertices. Uh, 
And it's harder, in fact, to do it in other representations. If you are using the adjacency matrix, you would have to add another row and again, change the values based on what. So one advantage is that only you only have to add that new row and design basically its uh, neighbors. And also, since you are adding a new row here, you basically have a new column and see who's going to that specific node from all of the other nodes. So the answer really is that in most of these representations, changing the graph, it's quite hard because you basically have to make rep uh, representative changes into the representation. Great, okay. Okay, so another representation and the second one, which uh, is represented here is that you can represent it with a list of list of integers. So that this is a representation in which you can indeed add another uh, uh, city and the neighbors of that city and only, only modify those other neighbors to add that they also have this new city as a neighbor. So it seems to me that this, the last representation, the one on the bottom is the easiest to change if you want to add additional neighbors. But again, it's only because you can add also neighbors in uh, additional nodes in the nodes in the vertices uh, array. And again, we'll, you will need a list of integers there because you have to add an element to the vertices. Another representation is to use an adjacency edge list. So in this representation, we are only putting in this list that represents that node, the neighbors of that node. So one, three, and five. But if you actually want to represent the edges, then you would have a list of edges in the element with index zero of neighbors. So it's edge zero to one, edge zero to three, and edge zero to five. Again, it is a popular representation, but it's basically just a more verbose representation of the adjacency vertex list. Uh, we are just representing the entire vertex instead of just the destination of that uh, edge. Another representation is basically, and this is the, the one that we saw before, but really represented with a list of uh, array list of edges. So it's basically similar to this one, instead of using an array of list of edges, we are using a list of array lists of edges. And this is the representation that I basically describe here that uh, basically what it does, it creates a new array list for the entire representation of the edges. Then uh, in that array list, we add the uh, another, uh, the first element is basically the edges that start from zero. So it's an array list of edges I'm getting the first element in neighbors, which is basically those neighbors of uh, zero. And I'm adding the edges starting from zero, zero to one, zero to three, and zero to five. And similarly, now we add the, the element, the array list representing edges that start from one. And in that list, I'm adding uh, edge from one to zero, one to two, and one to three, and so on to the last uh, node. So again, basically we have one element that represents, uh, let me actually do one change here just to state that there is, every time I have to add the, no, the neighbors, I'm basically creating the array list representing that one node, the node that we are looking, the last node that we are looking at. And this is a pretty good representation because it basically uses lists both for uh, the adjacency part and then for the uh, adjacency list part. Okay, so before we move to my implementation of graphs, the, uh, which is actually from the textbook, do you have any questions? Okay, so if there are no questions, let's continue with the implementation. 
So we are going to use the same technology that we did for uh, inspired by the Java collections framework. Basically, we start with an interface, the graph interface. It defines the common operations on a graph, but it doesn't implement any of them. It's an interface. It's the list of all of the methods representative for graphs. Then we have an abstract class named abstract graph that partially implements the graph interface, but it is an abstract class, so we cannot create an instance of this class. And then we have two implementations of abstract uh, of uh, graphs, an unweighted graph representation, which we'll discuss about today, and a weighted graph representation that will start at some time next uh, classes. And there are actually two different chapters if you look in the textbook. So first we'll represent standard unweighted graphs, and then we'll represent weighted graphs where the edges also have an associated cost or weight. So the main methods available for a graph, this is the interface graph. First of all, the get size returns the number of vertices in the graph. Get vertices returns the a list of all the vertices in the graph. Get vertex at an index uh, basically returns the vertex object at the specified index. Get index of a vertex. So because we had this mapping of integers to vertices, basically given a, a vertex, you can get the integer index of that vertex get neighbors of an index uh, vertex is basically a list of other integers indices uh, of the neighbors vertices of the current vertex. Uh, print edges or get degree first, get degree of an index uh, vertex is the degree of that vertex. We start with uh, unweighted graphs, uh, undirected graphs, so really, and actually it doesn't matter that much if it's directed graph, but the, there is a different definition of what a degree is. Because for unweight, uh, undirected graphs, the degree is all the, adjust, the number of adjacent edges. But for uh, directed graphs, there is this distinction between ongoing, on, uh, ingoing edges and outgoing edges. Print edges, uh, prints all the edges of the graph. Clear, clears the graph, basically deletes all of the no, uh, vertices and edges. Add vertex, adds a new vertex to the graph and returns false if the vertex already exists in the graph. Add edge between U and V, adds a vertex, as a edge, sorry, between the indices U and V of uh, vertices. Uh, DFS starting from a node V returns uh, an abstract graph tree. Basically, it's a tree, a spanning tree of the graph of the graph starting from the startup node V. And BFS similar, but for one is depth first and the other one is breadth first search. Then we have the abstract class, uh, abstract graph, which basically has the vertices implemented as a list of vertices and the neighbors represented as a list of list of edges. So we are, we are using the adjacency uh, edge representation of, uh, of, uh, of uh, graphs. Now we have two constructors, a construct, actually three constructors, one, a fourth construct, five constructors, one that basically constructs an empty graph one that cre creates a graph out of uh, an array of vertices and, uh, 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 and an adjacency matrix, basically an integer double dimensional array of all the list of all of the edges in the graph. We have one that stores as a list of all of the edges in the graph. Then we have another constructor that takes a uh, a matrix of all of a list or basically an array of arrays of ints, which is basically an array of uh, edges represented by pairs of uh, uh, integer uh, uh, indices. Then we have another constructor that takes a list of edges and 
the number of vertices. This time they are not labeled like we had in the previous uh, uh, first example, second example actually of the constructor. We have an add method that takes an edge and adds it to the graph and returns true if the graph didn't contain that edge uh, and we added it and false otherwise if it already contained that edge. And we have an inner class for the spanning tree uh, of, uh, of a graph. Then we have the unweighted implementation concrete class for a graph. And again, we have constructors with all of these different signatures that we saw above that can construct a, a graph with specified edges and vertices with a list of edges and vertices, and then with a list of specified edges and uh, just the in integer index of the vertices. We don't have the labels for the vertices. So first we have the interface and the interface is quite simple. It basically enumerates all of the methods, but it doesn't contain any one of the implementations. One feature that you should see in this interface is the fact that it is uh, using generics, the generic types. So the list of uh, vertices are of the type V. So really this V could be anything, any object in Java could be an integer or could be uh, the integer wrapper class, or it could be uh, an actual vertex uh, object. And similarly, we, this type V is used in all of the methods in get index of the vertex V, uh, in add vertex with the vertex V, which is the method defined down here. Uh, the depth first search returns a tree parameterized on the type V. And similarly, the back first search returns a tree. So as I said, the first implementation of uh, abstract graph implements the graph interface. And we keep the list of vertices in an array list. So it's basically a list of vertices of the type V. And then we keep the adjacency list as a list of list of edges. So it's the last representation that we have seen for, uh, uh, for uh, edges. So it's an adjacency list for the representation of all of the neighbors of every corresponding index in that list. So basically, if there is an edge from 0 to 1, 0 to 3, and 0 to 5, they will be uh, neighbors.get of zero would basically return that list that contains all of a list of edge objects, edge from zero to one, zero to three, and zero to five. So we have constructors. We have the first default constructor, which basically creates an empty graph. Both array list for vertices and the array list for neighbors are empty. Then we have a constructor that takes uh, an array of vertices and a double dimensional int matrix, which basically is the list of all of the edges. And for every one of them, you can see that for the vertices, I'm calling the add vertex method with the vertex at index i. And then I call the method create a justice list from the list of edges, array of edges, or matrix of edges uh, of the vertices length. And that will basically be implemented uh, next. Now, now we have another constructor abstract graph that takes a list of vertices. So we don't need to basically initialize the, uh, the uh, vertices anymore because we get them as a parameter and a list of edges. Now, the only thing that you can see is that I iterate over the vertices and I basically get every vertex and call the method add vertex to it with it. And then for, again, for uh, creating the edges, I call the method create adjacency list with the same list uh, edge of edges and the size of that list. I will skip the next two constructors because they basically follow the same method. In the first one, I iterate over the number of vertices uh, and I add a new vertex with an integer ID starting from zero to N minus one uh, to the array of vertices. 
and I do exactly the same thing for the next method. And then I call again in, uh, afterwards the create adjustacy list method. This create adjustacy list takes uh, the array of edges, which is an array of double dimensional array of ints and the number of vertices. I iterate over all of the edges and I call the method add edge between the index, the variable index uh, edge of i and zero and edge of i and one, because basically we know this, the second dimension is two always. It's the source and the destination of that edge. And similarly, I do for a list of edges instead of a double dimensional integer array. I iterate over the list of edges and I call the method add edge for edge of u and edge of v because this is a list of edge ob objects. So this class edge is basically an inner class to uh, our abstract graph. It's basically a class that has an integer u and an integer v, the starting vertex index of the edge and the ending vertex index of the edge. And basically I have a constructor that takes the vertex u and v and initializes the dynamic fields for u and v. Uh, the equals method basically checks that two edges are the same, are equal, if the starting vertex u index is the same with the ending vertex u and the destination v is the same with the object o's cast it to an edge destination v. So two edges are equal if they start in the same vertex and end in the same vertex index. Add, add edge, uh, basically if the starting uh, uh, vertex is either less than, uh, index is less than zero or greater than the size of the number of uh, vertices in the graph, I throw an illegal argument exception, no such index vertex in my entire graph. Otherwise, I basically check if the neighbors doesn't contain that, uh, uh, that edge yet, and that edge doesn't contain the actual edge E. And if that is not, uh, uh, if that is false, uh, basically then I get the array list that represents the neighbors of U, and I'm adding the edge E to those neighbors. So neighbors.get e e.u returns the neighbors of u and I add e to the neighbors of u. And I return true, otherwise I return false because that edge is already in the neighbors of u. Add edge given u and v as integers that just calls add edge with a new edge between u and v. Get size returns the size of the vertices subarray, which is a data field array. So basically, is the number of vertices in the graph, and get vertices just returns the vertices uh, list. Uh, get vertex given an integer uh, index, basically returns uh, from vertices the element at index at that given index. So it basically returns that vertex object uh, for that index. And get index of uh, V will basically search for V in the array list that is vertices and it will return the index of that vertex. So vertices can be labels of cities, but really within the graph representation, I'm using the integer index into that uh, vertices array. Get neighbors. So given an index of a node, uh, result is a list of integers, which are the indices of the neighbors. I'm iterating over uh, the neighbors of the index uh, vertex, which basically it's a list array list of uh, edges with an edge E. I'm iterating over all of the neighbors of index and I'm adding to the result that no, that vertex that is V in that edge E. So it basically gets the indices of all of the, the of the, all of the adjacent 
objects, uh, uh, nodes, uh, vertices to the current uh, vertex index. Get degree just returns the size of that array list that is the neighbors of the vertex V. Clear will basically delete all of the vertices and all of the edges. It's basically the two-dimensional neighbors matrix. Basically, I delete all of the uh, nodes in that matrix. So basically, the all of the array lists that were representing the uh, adjacent uh, edges to every single uh, vertex will be removed. Print edges. So I'm iterating, first of all, with the variable u from 0 to the size of neighbors, which is basically the, the list of all of the adjacency lists. Uh, I get the vertex correspond to u, like, for instance, the string that represents that vertex, like San Francisco, if that is, uh, let's say, 0. And then I'm printing that. Uh, so I'm printing uh, San Francisco with get vertex. And then I'm printing open parentheses u which is the index of that vertex. And then with the for loop, I iterate over all of the neighbors of u. So your neighbors.get u returns the edges that start from u. Now I iterate with a variable e over those vert uh, edges. Then I'm printing uh, that is an edge from u to v, which is basically the two data fields of uh, the edge uh, class object. And by going over all of the edges of the current node u, I basically uh, print all of the uh, uh, nodes that start, uh, end, uh, start from u and end in some other ad, uh, vertex. And this is a nested for loop within a for loop that iterates over all of the vertices. Adding a vertex, first I have to check if that vertex is not already in the vertex is array list, then I'm adding the vertex, and then I add uh, to neighbors an array list as the last element. So basically, this will just add the vertex that doesn't go anywhere. And I return true, that I was able to add a vertex. Or I return false if something went wrong. Like for instance, if the vertices uh, did contain that vertex already, I basically just return false. I can't add it because it's already there with the same label. Now, the first implementation of graphs is the unweighted graph. So the unweighted graph extends the abstract graph with multiple constructors. I have a constructor for an empty graph, one constructor that takes an array of vertices and an array of uh, a matrix of integers indices for the vertices. Then uh, a constructor that takes a list of vertices and a list of edges. And, and in this case, basically, I just, in all of these cases, I call the super class constructor equivalent constructor. So all of these methods were implemented in the abstract class. And then I basically represent, uh, call this uh, uh, graph prob uh, graph uh, implementation. I create an array of strings as the vertices that contain the names of cities in US. Then I create a, a list of edges, which is just a double dimensional uh, integer matrix. So I basically, it's an array of all of the arrays of indices that basically there is a flight from Seattle to San Francisco. There is another flight from Seattle to, to Denver, 03, and so on. So it basically is represented with, uh, representing with a matrix, uh, the flights, the edges in that graph. Then I create an unweighted graph with those edges and those, those vertices and those edges. And then I basically get the size of the graph is the number of uh, vertices in the graph. I get uh, other components of the graph, like for instance, the first uh, I'm getting the first uh, the the vertex with index one, uh, the index of Miami. Uh, the, I'm printing the edges of the entire graph. Uh, then 
I basically create a second graph with names of people, Peter, Jane, Mark, Cindy, Wendy, and so on. Uh, and also that like relationship, basically the fact that Zero or Peter likes uh, Mark and uh, Jane likes also Mark and so on. I can create another graph with this list of uh, uh, names and this list of edges that I had before. And again, I can get the size of that graph and print the edges. And this is basically the two examples that I had before. And this is just a graph representation. I haven't written any algorithms yet with graphs. Okay. I will stop here today because graph traversals is another problem by itself. And we, are, we don't have enough time, 15 minutes, 14 minutes to actually do graph traversals. I will do graph traversals next class. Uh, we'll study and cover at that time depth first traversal or depth first search, breath first traversal or breath first search, and they both result in a spanning tree, which is an inner class to the abstract class, uh, uh, abstract graph class. Okay. So we'll stop here for today. I will stop the recording and we will move to the lab portion of this class. Any questions?